Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot where the conversations are pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Did you bring your thinking caps? Because it's time to put them on. Because the conversation starts now. I got my certification and now I'm trying to launch my business. Well, Brains, let me tell you what she's going to do right here on the edge. We have Devorah Elias. And as she just explained, she was doing this type of work as a life coach, but now she's really, you know, going to do the deep dive. She's helping professional women with anxiety and panic. I raised my hand. I had an anxiety attack about two weeks ago. I thought I was coming up out the ground. I had yep. never had a panic attack before. And people live with this condition every single day. Yes. I don't know how they do it. It make you want to shoot yourself in the big toe. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty awful because usually when you're going through that, you think that you're having a heart attack. My first panic attack happened uh, in the bathroom <laughs> when I was a kid and I thought I was going to die. Well... I'm, I'm thinking beyond just, you know, a, a, a mild panic attack. I mean, I was, you know, nervous. I was screaming. Yeah. Uh, my heart was racing. It was yeah. uncontrollable. And I kept talking to myself. I said, who the hell is, excuse me, who the hell is this person? I did yeah. not know. I had never experienced any, well, somebody took me there, you know, my alcoholic brother. Oh, and uh, oh my God! And it was awful. And see, he's a narcissist, bless his yeah. heart. But I have to stay away from him because he will cause me to to really do something ugly. And oh. you know, people go back and forth. Uh, they anything can set them off. They say that it's a mental health issue. What is anxiety? Anxiety and an anxiety attack is essentially the fight or flight response on steroids. Uh. And most people say that it just comes out of nowhere. But in reality, there are clues and there are um, warning signs that it's ha going to happen. So when you start to feel an anxiety attack, you'll usually start to notice that your breath increases, your breathing increases, you start to sweat. You start to feel very nervous, as you said. And if you can't uh, do something to manage that, it will ramp up and turn into a full-blown anxiety attack. Well, and again, people say that they can't breathe. Uh, yeah. But sometimes it happens. I noticed it happened to my niece when we got on the airplane. <clears throat> yeah. We had to give her a paper bag to breathe into. She just could not take it. She just started getting really, really nervous and anxious. Yeah. Um, what brings on panic attacks? I mean, is there, again, is this a mental health challenge? Is this a chemical imbalance? I, I, I don't really don't know how to explain it. Well, a panic attack happens. It's centered in a very small organ in your brain called the amygdala. And... The fight or flight response is actually a very helpful response for people. And it's a leftover from when we lived in caves and people would go out, they would come upon a predator and the fight or flight response would go zing, you gotta get out of here. So what happens is your brain sends your blood to your extremities that, and that prepares your uh, legs and your arms to move quickly. Um, it happens instantaneously. And the thing about it is that you cannot stop it. You cannot control it. But what you can do is learn how to manage it. It's so kind of like, it's kind of like a hot flash. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is because, because wow. it's, it's, it's a, it's your, your neurons are firing and your hormones are firing and um, it all happens um, instantaneously. So what I teach people is how to, learn the, so the signals that say there's something that you need to be afraid of and you're going to start to feel panicky. And then I teach them uh, breathing techniques to use uh, to help to 
uh, decrease the sensation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I do that by teaching them mindfulness is the first step uh, because mindfulness is a very um, important part of what I teach. It helps you when you're practicing mindfulness, it helps you connect your physical feelings in your body with your emotions. So <clears throat> for example, if you are practicing mindfulness and you start to feel um, nervous, mm -hmm. you, you will be able to uh, perhaps recognize what the trigger is. Right. So, so you said your brother, so he may be a trigger for you. Girl, girl now, is he a trigger? He's the shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> he's the whole ball of wax he's the whole ball of wax and what happens is that um a lot of times when people go through pain uh or from what i hear and understand or my own experience is that it's premeditated almost you know like when i even think that he might call <clears throat> or i may see his name on my phone you know i just automatically go into this again fight uh flight or fight yeah. It automatically so cuts you off. So what I have to do is I really have to learn to, again, be more mindful and reframe it and say to myself, this is not what it is. You don't know. He might be in a good mood. This might be, you know, a breakthrough. This could be a positive experience. Don't always look at it in the negative. Yeah. So I teach people a breathing technique called box breathing. Hmm. And that's actually a breathing technique that they teach to Navy SEALs to help them with stress. So what I tell people is to practice the breathing technique, um, go into a dark room, uh, semi-dark, where you know you're not gonna be interrupted and practice the breathing technique for five to 10 minutes at a time, twice a day. And the reason I tell them to do that is because I want that to be ingrained in their muscle memory. So that when they start to feel panicking, they can automatically call that breathing technique up to help them dial it back down. Can you share that breathing technique with us? Yeah, what you do is you, you imagine in your mind's eye a square. You start in the bottom left and you breathe in for four counts. Move your eye up to the left, upper left corner, out for four. Breathe in. Move your eye to the right, out for four, breathe in, move your eye to the bottom right, breathe in, move your eye to the bottom left, breathe out. It becomes very monotonous people often get very bored. Um, but the idea behind it is to, as I said, ingrain it into your muscle memory so that when you start to feel panicking occurring, you can automatically call that breathing technique up and go through it. And it will, after you go through a number of repetitions of it, it you, you'll notice your heart rate will start to decrease, your uh, breathing will slow, and it's very effective. I believe that because the breath is the very first gift that our creator gave us. Yes, that's it, right. Breath <clears throat> life into us. And again, without the breath, you will not uh, exist. No, that's correct. There are other, there are other techniques that you can do. One is called a five, four, three, two, one grounding uh, technique. Yes, you know someone, that one? Yeah. Someone gave me that, uh, 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 Sugar Ray Leonard's son gave that to me. You know, that, that really helped. Also, emotional freedom technique, I'm a tapper. Okay, yep, that can help a lot, yes. I'm not very familiar with that, but I do know about it. It's, it's that... really cool, it's really cool. My husband said, why are you, when he when I first started doing it, he said, why are you beating on your chest like Tarzan? I said, so I don't go ape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so I, I teach this in a 10 week, um, a 10, 10 module um, program, which goes, for, uh, for 10 weeks of one module each week. And by the time people are finished with it, I have helped them equip themselves with a the Teflon coating to be mm. more, um, more resistant to the things that cause them to have anxiety. 
How do no you find question. yourself? How do you find yourself in this space, Devora? Well, I was working with a lot of people who had anxiety, and I myself have had anxiety my whole life, and I never really could figure out how to deal with it. It just would like hit me, and I would just panic, and I would be, you know, boom, going down the rabbit hole. And and it, when I would finally come back, it would just be like I would be like a dish rag. So I took a course in something called dialectical behavioral therapy. And that course is founded on mindfulness mm. and, and meditation. So as I was going through the program, I started to uh, practice mindfulness. I started to meditate every day. And what I discovered over time was that it really helped decrease my anxiety. Uh, so <clears throat> when I was working with these other people, I started to sort of teach them this program based on mindfulness, based on self-love, self-care, self-validation, self-compassion, uh, and all these other different techniques so that they are less, they are much more resistant to being in a situation where somebody's criticizing them and they automatically go, oh my God, I'm such an awful person. Why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why can't I ever do anything right? And boom, their anxiety is fired. Right, right, right. So that's, you know, that's crazy. Does this technique also work with children? Because now I've never in my life seen so many children diagnosed with anxiety, uh, you know, or different type of learning disabilities, ADHD, where they can't stay still, they can't focus. But in some schools, as I've shared before, is that they are teaching them mindfulness. They're teaching yes. them how to meditate. They're teaching yep. them about yoga. Yeah, um, They're really trying to help them calm down in a, what I consider traditional, but a pretty non-traditional kind of way. Yeah, I have not worked with children personally, um, and I, I would be hesitant to do that. Uh, but I know that they're teaching mindfulness and meditation in schools, and I applaud that because mindfulness is such a fantastic technique. And basically what it means is being present in your, in your life. Mm -hmm. Most of us would get up in the morning, we have our shower, we have our breakfast, we get dressed, we drive to work, we get there, we work, 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 come home, and then we rinse and repeat the same thing every day. Have you ever been in your car driving somewhere and you get there and you don't know how you got there. Girl, about an hour ago. <laughs> okay. And yeah. I passed by somewhere and I was like, you know, yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah. So if you, when you're mindful, what you are doing is being aware of your surroundings. You, it's, and John, John, John Kabat-Zinn calls that being awake. Mm -hmm. So you just, you're just savoring the moment, taking in the, uh, you know, the leaves on the trees, listening to the sound of the air rushing past the leaves and just being just being there and, and, and appreciating it. So what I find is that when people learn how to practice mindfulness, it really helps with anxiety because when you're having anxiety, you are either in the past thinking about something that happened before or you are in the future worrying about something that's going to happen tomorrow mm. and none of those things are things that we can control right so when you're in the moment you cannot think about what's happened before or going to happen tomorrow you are right there where you are let and me, that let me ask you a cultural question what is your ethnicity i was born in south korea i'm half korean half caucasian okay so you're korean was your mother korean my birth mother, yes, she was Korean, but I'm adopted. Okay. Uh, I, I grew up with a Japanese father and a mother from Appalachia. So the Asian culture is very rooted in mindfulness and being present. I, I've yes. traveled to Asia a few times, so I, I understand that. Uh, they don't speak a lot about traditional or what we consider traditional religion, but it's right. always about being mindful being still, being in the moment, and being patient. And I think yes. that really comes out, you know, in you. I can see that, that wisdom in you. And that's very, very valuable because sometimes it takes a lot of people, regular old Americans, uh, you know, 
they go from, they just go off on a tangent. I like to say from a flicker to a flame. It doesn't take much. But when yeah, well, I, th I think North Americans, we kind of live our lives, um, you know, like on, like adrenaline being pumped into us through IVs, right? Mm -hmm. So when you practice mindfulness, you sort of pause that. Most of most people I know are so busy, you know, constantly in motion. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to go there. I have to plan this. And you lose a sense of who you are when you're living a life like that. Mm -hmm. it, and it can be very self-defeating in the long range. I mean, I, my sense of calmness or whatever you want to ca call it has taken me years to get to. Um, but, and I got there through, through practicing mindfulness and self-care, self-love. Um, but I mean, this has been a, a long-term journey for me. Um, and, but what, do you I, you find, know, what do you find valuable in meditation? You know, I had to stop meditating for a while because I was getting downloads. And those downloads, I felt like I had to act on them right away. And I went to God and I said, you know what? Can you give this to me in bite-sized pieces? Because I'm feeling overwhelmed. Meditation, if you really get into that state, you can put yourself into a state of hypnosis. But again, it's being quiet, it's being still. A lot of people don't even know how to be quiet and be still anymore. Uh, yeah. When I'm meditating, I concentrate on my breath and I, I pay attention to my breathing. And I and so if I have a thought, you know, if another thought comes into my mind, I will acknowledge it. I say, oh yes, that's a thought. And I come back to my meditation come back to my breathing. Or if I have a feeling, oh, okay, yes, I'm feeling uh, happy. Okay, yes, that's a feeling, come back to the meditation. And it's really, people, they struggle with the idea of um, emptying their mind mm -hmm. of thoughts and feelings and reactions. Um, but, but I find it very calming. I try to do it twice a day. Um, you, I don't you always say twice a day, really? I, yeah, I try to. Yeah, I try to. I don't always succeed because I have a busy life. Yeah, but I, I I try to make time for it every day. And when I don't, I, do, I you know, well, combination because sometimes I I com combine my prayer time and my meditation at the same time, but I don't do it every day. But when I do do it, I do it for long periods of time to the point where, have you ever seen like psychedelic colors? No, ma'am. Oh, I, I see colors and I can call on those colors and I relate those colors to my chakras. You know, like okay. I'll, I'll see purple or sometimes <clears throat> you know, I'll ask to seek the white light. Uh, yeah. 30, you know, or red, the root chakra, the you know throat chakra. So I always see colors in my meditation and I always ask proverbial questions like how can it get any better than this or what else is possible see brains there's a lot of different types of meditation there's um sound meditation there is um quieting meditation there yeah. is a uh, nature uh there's I sometimes I've done it where I've hugged trees there's yeah. a lot of different things you have to find it it's like an exercise it's an exercise for the mind and the brain whatever fits you it's not one size fits all and yoga is preparation for meditation because it loosens the body and it connects you with the breath do you participate yeah. in yoga no i don't i i am just i i tried yoga wasn't any good at it not my not one of my gifts but i think that prayer is a form of meditation right oh, and, and if you're if, when you're in the right headspace and you're really you know connecting with your god figure Oh my God, it's mind blowing. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I try to uh, teach these things to my clients and I find that actually when people understand where anxiety comes from in their brain, believe it or not, it changes a lot of the, the rest of the work for them. Because when they realize that it's not something that's wrong with them. It gives them an opportunity to take that anxiety and channel it and turn it into power. Right, and, and make it something constructive and build from it. Because yes. Once you do that, it changes every aspect of your life. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, I was always terrified, you know, that I would be out somewhere 
and something would happen and I would have an anxiety attack because when I was having them, I was absolutely useless. And so I became really afraid and that caused even more anxiety, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it gets to be, can get be a vicious cycle and it feeds on itself. So the, the key I think is, is learning how to, um, you know, take its power away as it starts to, to come on and channel it into something different. Now, so are you, I, with, are you doing group sessions or are you working one-on-one -on -one with individuals? I'm going to be doing uh, group sessions. I'm going to be making a, an offer um, on my website for that and, and Facebook for that. So I haven't done it yet, but I will be doing it. It's one of my next things I'm going to try. You know, I think groups are great because each one teaches one and you feed off of one another and then you have yeah. a support system as well. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, because you'll say, oh, well, you know, you've been through this. Well, what was your experience? And, you know, how did you get over it? How, you know, how did it impact you? So groups are very, very powerful. A lot of times people need that one-on-one -on -one because, again, their anxiety level may be crowds. Yeah, so I have right. anxiety around crowds. I don't like crowds. I've been trampled three times in a oh, crowd. Oh, dear. Three yeah, times. I don't, I <clears throat> I don't like being in crowds either. And since COVID and everything, I really don't like being around crowds. <clears throat> but um, yeah, my anxiety was always, you know, like performance anxiety when I would have to give a talk or something like that. I would get so nervous and so uh, overwhelmed that I would just almost pass out. So, That's odd because <clears throat> you were in the, you were in, was it theater production? Yeah. Was it? Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that. Oh, it was mostly just, you know, all, only amateur theater. Um, I had oh, a dream. That's, that's where the, 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 uh, the creativity sparks. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I had a dream to, you know, go to New York and get on Broadway and everything. But I finally realized that I, not only did I not have the talent to do that, I also didn't have the internal fortitude. You know, I would not be able to handle the constant rejection and constant trying to prove myself over and over and over again. Because when you're in the theater, you're only as good as your last job. So right. I, I abandoned that idea. And I, you know, I, I did get a, a, dip, a diploma from um, a college in Toronto in technical theater production. I trained to be a professional stage manager. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I never, I never actually worked in my field because my husband got sick and then he died. And uh, I was just, you know, one thing after another. So, uh, but I have that. Credential. Are you living in Canada now? Yes, I do. I live in London, Ontario. What do you What do you think about Canada? Do you like I love it? Canada. Love I Canada. Do. Love it. I have been here for forty five years. Um, I will never return to the United States because there's too much gun violence and too many crazy politicos. <laughs> so I'm here. This is my country, and I love it here. I love it there too, but the taxes there, you know, taxation everywhere. You, yeah. you give up one for the other. Now, is it cold there in London, Ontario? Not right now, but it will, it will be getting cold. Like we'll get a, they're projecting a lot of snow this winter, mm. which of course I'm happy about. Oh, I love the snow, not. <laughs> well, I see you have a little dog. Does your dog like the snow? Oh, he loves the snow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and my, my dog is a Tibetan terrier, and Tibet is actually where mindfulness comes from. Mm -hmm. It was it's practiced by the Tibetan monks. So, well, there is a uh, temple not too far from my house, and as a cultural experience, I went and I just kind of sat in the back <laughs> and I watched him, and it was so odd to be acknowledged in silence. Mm -hmm. And so now my goal is to go, probably not, well, the end of the year, uh, to go to a silent retreat. My girlfriend went. She said for five days, she didn't talk. And I said, well, how was that? She said, it was unbelievable. It raised your heightened sense of awareness. You were able to use your other senses, yep. your sight, you know, your, your hearing was magnified, your touch, your taste, everything, but running at cotton picking mouth. 
So yeah. I want to try that. Is that something that you might be willing to try one day? I would, yes, I would do something like that. I know someone who did that <clears throat> and he said it was the most remarkable, mm -hmm. profound experience he had ever had. Mm -hmm. um, I, I used to talk all the time, <laughs> constantly. And as I've been on my journey, I have uh, learned to sit in silence and not have to fill up the, the silence with right. idle talk. Right. And that's, that's been a great big, huge change for me. And um, I like it, you know? But it's a huge gift because we over talk just like we overthink. And we can talk ourselves into a situation just by running our mouth instead yeah, but of actually listening. I think, yeah, I think that most people, though, when they're having anxiety, it's their thoughts, right? And they don't know how to stop the, the thought machine. And it just kind of keeps going on. And it, it drags them off into this vortex, right? And, um, oh, I almost fell off my chair. Oh, um, that's okay. Yeah. So, you know, that's one of the things that I also try to teach, you know, is how to calm your thoughts and how to, you know, kind of disengage your thoughts from your, from your feelings. Because it does become a vicious cycle. Yeah, it does, and it will crush you. Yep. So let's, let's ask some fun things about you. How about that, Devora? <laughs> okay. What's one of your hobbies? Oh, uh, I think, well, I collect, um, <laughs> it's going to laugh at me. I collect uh, kiddish cups. They're like the wine goblets that Jewish people use on Friday nights. Oh, okay. I, I have about 25 of them. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I, I like to take pictures. I, I take pictures of dogs and I have probably, I don't know, 200 pictures of dogs in my iPhone. Um, oh, maybe make a coffee table book. I might someday. I might. Cause when I'm out and I meet a dog, I always want to take his picture. <laughs> my other hobbies. Uh, I like to sing. I'm not oh, too good okay. at it anymore, but I like to sing. Well, if you study theater, I'm sure that you have a lot of theatrical talent. Have you ever thought about writing a script or writing a play? I have written four plays. Wow. I have one one produced. Um, trying to get a stage reading organized in my other one that I wrote with my husband and not having much success. I've actually been trying to find uh, someone who'd be willing to collaborate with me on that uh, project. Mm -hmm. I haven't had much. I, well, I haven't really uh, looked very hard because I don't really know where to start, but I am going to try to find somebody. Well, you can start right there in Facebook. I'm sure you got a thousand people uh, and other people that you know in the theater community. People fail to grab the low hanging fruit that's yeah. right there in front of them. You know, we, we go out and we seek strangers where there's people that follow us and know us. So, you know, tap into that reservoir. If uh, you had three wishes, what would they be, Devora? I think they would wish for peace on earth, first of all. I would wish for an end to homelessness and I would wish for a cure for cancer. Wow. Those are big things. They're bigger than mine. I would wish to be uh, able to travel through time. Mm, yeah. And where would you go? Oh my God. I go probably back to the 1920s. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to go to 3000. Um, and um, I like to maybe sometimes be invisible. Oh, yes. Wouldn't that be lovely? Uh, yes. it, it would be. But then, too, you know, you be careful what you ask for because you just might get it. You know, people, you, you don't know what, what lies on the other side of that. And I would like um, to leave a legacy of love. You and know, kindness. Just, and kindness. Just simplicity. <laughs> Yeah. And that love means meeting people where they are, not asking you to change or acculturate or assimilate. Just let me love you right where you are. Yep. And that takes a lot. That takes a yeah. lot. Big challenge for most people it to is. be able to, to accept people for who they are. Yeah. Without asking them, what do you do? Where do you work? How much money do you make? Are you are you a Democrat or a Republican? Yeah, 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 yeah. Girl, please, I don't even. Yeah, I can I can just feel the the energy and but it's it's five G. What do you think about the times that we're in right now? Because you know, like I know we're in a lunar vortex. 
the whole world, the whole universe, the whole alignment is changing. Do you feel it? I feel it. I see it. Yeah, I'm very worried about climate change because of the world that I'm going to leave behind for my grandchildren, right? I don't have a car, and that was a conscious decision on my part to give up my car. And so that is my contribution to the fight against climate change. Um, I, I, I try not to use, you know, single use plastic, I recycle, I compost, I, you know, I do all those things. But, you know, we are living in really scary times, I think, and I have to really, really practice mindfulness to keep myself where I am and not going off into the future. Oh my God, what's going to happen, you know, when the next hurricane happens, et cetera, et cetera. Because when I go there, I just get overwhelmed and just like really quickly. So I, I make myself stay in the present. Well, you are the gift. You are the present. Please tell my brains how to get in contact with you, Devora, so that they can work with you. Uh, let us know about your upcoming offering and the course that you're going to be offering to people. I want people to tune in. I'm going to try to make some time to check in with my mindfulness because uh, you can always learn mm -hmm. something. You don't know what you don't know. Three. So, Devora, I want people to work with you on uh, a very deep, integrate intricate level um, in groups or as individuals, what is the best way to contact you? By email, uh, H-E-L-L-O at W-O-M-A-N-S-U-P-E-R-P-O-W-E-R-S.com. Okay, that's wonderful. That is www womensuperpowers.com yes all right and Thank you. i'm going to put that information on the back of the interview also you said that you have a current offering tell us a little bit about that so we have something to look forward to i think i'm going to offer um a workshop on how to practice mindfulness um a lot of people when i'm teaching that skill they say, oh, am I, I'm a, no, I don't think I'm doing it right. And I always say to them, well, it's not really a matter of right or wrong. Mindfulness is a state of being. Right. Uh, but the beauty about mindfulness is that you can do it almost anywhere at any time. It's free. And all it takes is you can even do it, you know, for 20 seconds at a time. So I tell people start in the shower being mindful. So you want to feel the, the warm water on your body, smell the bath shower gel that you're using when you're washing your hair. Notice how it feels, the water running through your hair and the smell of the shampoo. Uh, so those are some very simple ways to start practicing mindfulness. You can practice it when you're washing the dishes, um, you know, feeling the the suds in the in the sink and you know smelling the soap that's uh, in the sink, feeling what the dishcloth feels like in your hand, and just just paying attention to those small things. I did uh, a mindful meditation at a restaurant. We did mindful eating. Don't yes, we? we were at the table. I bet you two hours because you took a small portion, you chewed it, you chewed it till it was almost liquefied. Yep. You allowed it to lay on the palate. You tasted every fragrance, uh, you know, that was permeating from every spice. You put mm -hmm. your fork down. You enjoyed the conversation with the person. If we did this, number one, you probably lose some weight. Uh, yep. Because food and cooking is a meditation. We are what we eat. It's very spiritual. So yep. starting with that, and I like how you say, you know, when you take a shower, just enjoy the water don't just try to get in there and get out just enjoy the water i love a bath i'm still a yeah a bath yeah i'd love to get in there with some epsom salt and just sit there and think about nothing or put on mm -hmm. some music um that, it's wonderful so you have given us some very very thought provoking grounding powerful tools to take away with uh, in this interview and i thank you so much for your time 
We will definitely check you out. I'm going to put your information in the back. Once your programs are up and running, please let me know so that I can share that. Brains, I need you to go in, like, love, and share right here. You see that? <laughs> Move my finger so you know what to do. Like, love, share, and subscribe. I go all over the world to bring you the best and the brightest, and I did not stop short right here. Thank you so much, Devorah. You are the best. Thank you, April. All right, Brace, get yourself together. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I, I, I so appreciate the opportunity.